Hey everyone, it's time for another installment in this series where we expose all the frauds at Discovery Institute, the Christian propaganda mill whose sole purpose is to lie about science for Jesus. In the hot seat today is Douglas Axe. Who is he and how does he lie? Axe has degrees in chemical engineering, which of course do not qualify him whatsoever to open his mouth about evolutionary biology, but we all know how the DI operates by now. He's a professor at Biola University, an evangelical Christian school originally founded as the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, and its website sports the slogan, Be Brilliant for Christ. Indeed, Douglas. Indeed. In 2010, he was the founding editor of Biocomplexity, Discovery Institute's in-house make-believe journal, which we will revisit a bit later. He was also the founding director of the now-defunct Biologic Institute, a front established by the DI to make it seem like they actually do scientific research, but which never got past a website and some rented office space. In 2012, they filmed an interview with one of their researchers, appearing to be standing in some kind of lab space, but it was later revealed that she had been filmed on green screen and superimposed onto a stock photo of a lab from Shutterstock. Don't believe me? Here's the original stock image from Shutterstock's website. Whoopsie. Once everyone found out the truth, they took the video down, but everything lives forever on the internet. In 2021, the DI pulled the plug and Biologic ceased to exist, having failed at gathering even an ounce of positive PR, its only true purpose. And these morons wonder why everyone makes fun of them. Much like all other creationists masquerading as scientists, Axe wrote a crappy book promoting intelligent design. It's called Undeniable, How Biology Confirms Our Intuition That Life Is Designed. You know, since molecular biology is obviously nothing but common sense and intuition. The subtitle basically translates to, I like believing in creationism, so it's true. Not surprisingly, when he preaches to lay people, he uses this exact approach to entice them into believing that their blind faith is worth more than real science. Playing into the hands of people who would like you to believe that this is at heart a technical question, that you need a PhD to know whether we are cosmic accidents or not. And I firmly believe you do not need a PhD to know whether we are cosmic accidents or not. I think that is a matter of common sense. Um, we can know that with certainty without having special educational training, without having expertise. That's right. Why actually study or learn anything? Any toddler knows just as much as Nobel Prize winning biologists, according to Axe. Furthermore, instead of following other ID evangelists and pretending that the identity of the designer is open to interpretation, he just openly calls it the Christian God. Screw subtlety, right? This generic and uninspired children's pamphlet says nothing we haven't debunked before, so let's get to what's special about Dougie Boy. Are you ready to be surprised? He has actual peer-reviewed papers. That's rare for anyone at the DI, but it's true, Axe has three of them. The first was published in 2000 in the Journal of Molecular Biology and marvelously foreshadows all the anti-evolution bullshit he will spew in the decades to come. The title of the paper is Extreme Functional Sensitivity to Conservative Amino Acid Changes on Enzyme Exteriors. The gist of the paper is that if you alter a substantial proportion of exterior residues, proteins lose their functionality. Shocking. If you change the amino acid sequence a lot, it doesn't do the thing that amino acid sequence does. Of course, that's why protein coding sequences are the most highly constrained regions of a genome. But that's why we have to look at the data to see what the paper actually says compared with the creationist spin the DI uses when referencing it, that proteins are magically perfect and could never have evolved by chance. What this study actually shows is that many combinations of mutations allow the proteins in question to function at similar levels. And even more combinations than that still permit some function, even if it's reduced. Well, that's not really surprising at all now, is it? And wouldn't you know it, this is all evolution needs to operate. The data actually support evolution. Given some non-functional sequences, mutations can generate any one of the countless functional sequences, whether it's optimal or not. And from there, subsequent mutations and natural selection will improve it, until billions of years later, you end up with proteins that have remarkable efficiency and specificity. This is basic evolutionary biology, and there are countless examples of precisely this process being physically observed. 
Here's a paper from 2006 that describes essentially this, called Darwinian evolution can follow only very few mutational paths to fitter proteins. Apart from mutations increasing antibiotic resistance in a strain of bacteria, it describes the constraints on the evolutionary paths available to living organisms. This is important because it highlights the fact that there is always more than one sequence that can accomplish a biochemical function. Anyway, Axe typically forgets he ever wrote this 2000 paper, fixating instead on his second paper from 2004. This was also published in the Journal of Molecular Biology titled Estimating the Prevalence of Protein Sequences Adopting Functional Enzyme Folds, and it's one of the most frequently cited papers among creationists. The gist of the paper is that according to Axis calculations, the likelihood of evolving a specific functional protein fold is as low as 1 in 10 to the 77, and creationists, including Axe, promote this result as evidence that functional proteins could not possibly evolve without intelligent input, because big scary number. To put it bluntly, this paper is garbage. Since this is the one he talks about all the time, let's go through the major errors so that everyone can see how bad this paper is and how dishonest any credentialed person must be in order to promote it. First, Axe starts with a known fold in a beta-lactamase as a target, ignoring the obvious fact we just discussed, that there are almost certainly unknown sequences that would accomplish the exact same function. Yet again, this is something that no creationist seems to have the courage to accept. Everything they see in biology has to be viewed as so super ultra-perfect, and couldn't be even the tiniest bit different or it wouldn't work. In reality, when we survey random sequences for function, we find a lot of sequences that we didn't know were functional before. Here's a study from 2017. Random sequences are an abundant source of bioactive RNA or peptides. It describes how we once thought that duplication and recombination of existing genes were the only way to account for novel function, since random non-coding DNA would be highly unlikely to offer any kind of function upon which natural selection could operate and optimize. Now we know for a fact that orphan or de novo genes are a thing, which we've discussed several times before, but this paper also describes the proportion of random sequences that have some kind of favorable bioactivity, and it's much higher than previously expected, up to 25% in fact. Therefore, random parts of the genome could rapidly become functional when expressed. This is echoed further throughout the paper, like in the discussion section, where E. coli growth is favorably impacted by random RNA or peptide sequences. This also mirrors papers we have discussed in Origin of Life research when debunking James Tour, where a non-negligible proportion of RNA sequences were found to have some relevant catalytic function. Here's another very recent paper titled Selection of a De Novo Gene that can promote survival of Escherichia coli by modulating protein homeostasis pathways. This ties into what we just said about orphan genes and the question as to how brand new proteins expressed by these orphan genes can become integrated into existing cellular pathways. It turns out that 2,000 out of 100 million genes screened with totally random sequences bearing no resemblance whatsoever to native genes were able to rescue growth arrest of E. coli. And one random protein in particular did so through highly specific interactions with existing proteins. It was also demonstrated that these random proteins can rapidly improve via mutation and natural selection on a timeline that is physically observable. Figure 1 illustrates their methodology nicely, showing the 2,000 hits and the one highly specific inhibitor. Here's yet another paper by Jack Shostak and Anthony Keefe, which generated a pool of 6 times 10 to the 12 random amino acid sequences, which were then tested for the specific function of binding ATP. Not one, not two, not three, but four different proteins in that pool were found to be able to bind ATP. And furthermore, those four sequences were totally unrelated to each other, as well as anything in bioinformatics databases at the time, meaning no relation to anything found in living organisms. Here's a quote. We therefore estimate that roughly 1 in 10 to the 11 of all random sequence proteins have ATP binding activity comparable to the proteins isolated in this study. This frequency is similar to the recovery of ATP binding RNAs from random sequence RNA libraries with similar KD values. There you have it. Axe says 1 in 10 to the 77. Experimental data shows 10 to the 11. He is 66 orders of magnitude off. And guess what? Shostak's paper is from 2001, three years before Axe's. 
So clearly and indisputably, there are innumerable sequences that are functional, yet don't exist. This is the case for two reasons. First, evolution is a contingent process. If three sequences do a thing approximately equally effectively, the one that evolves first is going to propagate via natural selection, and the other two might never have a chance to come about. That's blind chance, and the experiments that show how functions are common in random sequences also very clearly demonstrate that you can't assume a sequence isn't functional just because we haven't found it in nature. And second, biochemically, many combinations of amino acids will have approximately the same shape and same properties, leading to functional similarities. We've talked about this so many times before, but pretending that changing one or several amino acids destroys biological function is just ridiculous. So right off the bat, one of the baseline assumptions is invalid. Another one of Axe's underlying assumptions, different in a subtle way from the first, is that you can learn about frequency of functions by starting with a specific target. This approach assumes that functional sequences are rare in an absolute sense, and that the target you've selected represents the only way to accomplish a specific function. This beautifully demonstrates both Axe's bias and ignorance, as the assumption flies in the face of experimental results. When you generate lots of random sequences and evaluate how well they do a specific function, not just any function, but a specific function, it turns out that a lot of different sequences can do that function close to equally well. One study that illustrates this problem for Axe was published in 2018, called Random Sequences Rapidly Evolve into De Novo Promoter. Here, random strings of about 100 base pairs were evaluated for their activity as a promoter for the lac operon in E. coli. About 10% of randomly generated sequences functioned as a promoter, and if the bacteria were subsequently allowed to evolve, 60% of the randomly generated sequences had activity comparable to the wild-type promoter after just a single mutation. Figure 3 shows levels of expression before mutation in red, several of which are somewhat comparable to the wild type, and then after the first mutation in blue, several of which do better than the wild type. Let's describe these results in the context of the big scary numbers that creationists like to spew. If we assume that the wild type sequence was the only way to accomplish that function, like Axe wants you to believe, then the likelihood of generating a functional 100 base pair sequence randomly would be 0.25 raised to the 100th power, which works out to approximately 1 in 10 to the 61. Pretty similar to the big scary number Axe cited in his study. But real world data shows just how ridiculous this is. When we do real experiments with real sequences and test those sequences for function, what we find over and over again, no matter what the context, is that it's actually pretty easy to evolve functional sequences, and they aren't rare at all. Now, this paper was published in 2018, and most of the other research we are discussing to demonstrate this point was also published after Axe's 2004 paper. But do you think Axe and the rest of the DI are up to date on all this research, or modify their discussion of molecular biology accordingly? Of course not. They talk about this dumb paper all the time and spew the same debunked talking points about it all the time, because it's literally the only peer-reviewed paper that can be desperately spun into supporting intelligent design in any way. It's all they have. Even giving Axe a pass on all the problems we just described, there is still the critical conceptual error in the paper. Evolutionary processes don't have targets. They just find what works. Bacteria aren't searching for the one and only trick that will generate antibiotic resistance. Evolutionary processes produce a bunch of different things, and the things that work stick around because they confer a survival advantage. By identifying a specific target sequence as a goal, Axe invalidates all of his own work because that's not how evolution works. Now, that is just the main egregious error on Axe's part. There are a bunch of other shady details regarding his methodology that, if not described in excruciating detail, can at least be mentioned briefly. He chose for his study a variant of the beta-lactamase that had a lower activity to begin with, and on top of that, it was extremely temperature-sensitive. This made the protein orders of magnitude more sensitive to mutation than the wild type, in order to get data that he could more easily twist to fit his design. Conclusion. 
Also, he makes absolutely no mention of the well-known fact that the specific TEM1 enzyme he investigates is only one specific class of beta-lactamases, while several other families of beta-lactamases are known that have completely unrelated structures. So it's not even other hypothetical sequences he's ignoring by pretending nature needs one specific sequence. He's ignoring other known existing sequences. It makes you wonder, how could such a smart guy with such a great pedigree be so profoundly clueless? Smart people, highly educated, brilliant people who are working in a certain field can still come to stupid conclusions. It, it is possible. Once again, this paper was published all the way back in 2004, so you'd think Axe would have continued to build on this work, flawed as it is, and have more peer-reviewed publications that creationists can misinterpret and misrepresent. But you'd be wrong, this is the only real paper Axe published on this topic. His third paper from 2008 describes a computational model and is not directly relevant to his anti-evolution apologetics. Isn't that a bit odd? Typically, when a paper is as revolutionary as creationists pretend this one was, it unleashes the floodgates of research, with many studies bringing the approach into new territory to further expand the conclusions of the initial study. Well, not here. Instead, since 2010, Axe has published no fewer than nine articles in Biocomplexity, Discovery Institute's fake journal I mentioned earlier. Again, this is the fake journal where Axe is a founding editor. Can't pass peer review because what you're doing isn't real science? Be your own peer. This is what passes for peer review at a creationist propaganda mill. It's clueless preachers cosplaying as a legitimate publishing house to manufacture a veneer of credibility. In reality, everyone can see that it's really just a closed ecosystem where creationists can pretend they're reviewing each other's work before posting it on the website for the journal, which is basically just a blog with strict formatting requirements. And to make it even worse, most of Axe's publications in biocomplexity are just reheated versions of his 2004 paper. Look how hard it is to evolve proteins through Darwinian processes, you guys. Don't read any of the real research that proves me wrong. Just read my glorified blog post. Anyway, there isn't much more to say about the scientific output of Douglas Axe because he seems to have completely stopped trying, preferring to milk one paper from 20 years ago for all it's worth, which was not much in the first place. But there is still a bit more to talk about because Axe, in a completely predictable twist, has spent the last few years completing his transformation into raving anti-establishment lunatic and ultra-conservative pawn. He went full-on conspiratorial anti-vaxxer, filling his Twitter feed with arguments against COVID vaccines that range from merely misleading to outright wrong and idiotic. After 18 months of COVID vaccination, is it helping? How the federal government used evangelical leaders to spread COVID propaganda to churches. Ooh, the Daily Wire, they're reliable. Oh, what's this? The COVID vaccine is a bigger threat to kids than COVID? Based on what exactly? He even co-authored a book to cash in on the paranoia. The Price of Panic. Oh my, the unbelievable tyranny of scientists and medical professionals producing vaccines on a mind-bendingly rapid timeline that saved millions of lives. The Horror. Of course, if you're up to speed on this series, this rhetoric should be no surprise whatsoever. Actually, it's perfectly on brand for Discovery Institute. Remember John G. West and his pathetic leaflet about totalitarian science? Never forget, despite their desperate attempt to appear like scientific scholars, at their heart, Discovery Institute is first and foremost a culture war propaganda outlet. The science was always secondary to the mission of Christian nationalism, and Axe's trajectory is representative of the broader trend among creationist organizations over the past few years to more or less give up pretending to care about the science and just lean hard into conservative culture war causes. Theocracy in America. Keep kids stupid. Keep women pregnant. Keep everyone brainwashed enough to reject any form of expertise on any subject so that they're nice and easy to control. Control their consumer habits and control them in the voting booth. That's the real point of Discovery Institute, and that's the mission statement that Douglas Axe serves. Anti-intellectualism oozes out of every pore of this guy's body. If Gopnik is right and the four-year-olds are wrong, 
then the picture looks like this, doesn't it? It's an elitist view of science. We are all down here on the lowlands, but the elite educated experts are up there in the ivory tower. They understand the truth about such important questions as where did we come from, what are we, and where are we going. The rest of us, if we want to know the correct answers, we'll have our own sort of prejudicial, naive, common sense answers. But if we want to know the truth, we, we depend on them. We have to look up to the ivory tower and they will dispense their wisdom, wisdom and we will either receive it or not. Um, but if the four-year-olds are right, the true picture looks more like this, right? <coughs> okay? <coughs> Everybody on these big matters has an innate knowledge of what's true. And they either fight against it or they don't, but they know what's true. And the academy has dug themselves into a hole by coming up with an alternative explanation, an alternative version of the truth. Yes, the ivory tower of people who know things because they actually study and learn about them. In Axe's imaginary utopia of baby super geniuses, any human can immediately know or do anything just because they want to. Everyone can fix their own cars, build skyscrapers, and cure diseases with nothing but the pure will of the Lord. That's Axe's advice. Stay as clueless as a small child your whole life. A cozy message for those too lazy to learn and too weak-minded to shake off their indoctrination. This is exactly what Christian nationalists want. An entire population of adults who think like four-year-olds. They're not even trying to hide it anymore. Luckily for the rest of us, despite the good diction and friendly personal trainer vibes, Axe is just as bumbling and incompetent as every single other boner on the DI roster. So that's it for Douglas Axe, the fake biologist, blog writer, and conspiracy peddler. These guys really are all the same, aren't they? Nevertheless, we have a few more idiots to get through, if you can believe it, so I'll see you next time.